Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Black African power. What's good? What's happening? A well organized lie. Defeats of this organized truth every time. Woohoo, we. Man, y'all already know what it is, man. It's God killing the house. And I'm coming to do what I got to do. And I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm standing tall. I'm standing strong. Hey, look, man. Community skeptics on deck. Well, y'all already know what it is, man. Let me get this content rolling for y'all, man. Go have a good one. It's a good one. Um, y'all ain't seen it. It's a great interview. Uh, I think we put together the proper information so that y'all could follow it i'm thinking the questions i asked were there that y'all can kind of grasp the magnitude of the conversation man you know that interview we had me and garfield with dr maggie uh bryson man it was a good one um i think we made some points that was she made some points that was very clear we appreciate her for actually being on the channel, man. Uh, she did a great job with that. And, you know, we can just, you know, we we, we just appreciate that. Um, so, you know, with that one, um, we, we, we gonna get it rocking. Um, let me, I'm trying to set, now let me get, hold on, let me get this to grab her here real fast. So I forgot what I was doing here. What was I trying to find? Okay, hold on. Let me get this in here right. Let me get this in here. Get this in here. To click, click them up. All right. So, you know, we want to always make sure we clear. Let's get the people up in the building, man, to enjoy this interview. It was a good one. Uh, this is from our series, man. Um, interviews with experts, man. Uh, we and we just want to give a special shout out to Garfield, man. You know, he actually been throwing this alley oops, man. He's been dedicated and he putting in some good work on this. And you know, he yeah, he making it happen. So we gotta give credit where credit is due, man. He's actually spearheading that, you know, making sure uh, you know, giving the pseudo killers and the community skeptics, uh, giving us access to his Rolodex that he has compiled, man. He's finding that and he's making sure we in on it. We got another one coming up Monday, the tomorrow. All right, um, our brother Sosa going to be there. And, yeah, we're just going to keep it going. And we got a surprise one coming up later on in the month. These are all Egyptologists, man. You know, we just, we 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 reached the impasse where, you know, we're tired of um, bad information being put forth. And, and so we bring the experts in to bring clarity where the brothers just can't, where the brothers and sisters just can't. And, you know, for me, <clears throat> I want to make this point. There's two points I really want to make. You know, I want to do a breakdown of this interview. But I'm not going to do a breakdown to y'all whole hell, I mean, heard the whole interview. Not going to mix my voice in, you know, with the whole interview to get the whole thing mixed up and mumble jumbled. Right? I want y'all to hear it clear and straight through. Right? Y'all can make determinations, take y'all notes, get y'all notepads together. Right? And so we can just get this. Right? And, you know, I'm trying to figure out, like, people make the points, well, you know, why, why, why are you not friends with this person, that person? And you should never allow other human beings to use your friendship as a means of getting something that ain't right off. I'm going to say this again. Never allow people to use their friendships as a means that will allow them to get things off that are wrong. And, you know, the only reason I'm on YouTube is to give back to the community. I ain't me. I'm not on YouTube to be the guy that's always right. No, I want to show the community that you can change a life around and actually have interviews with experts you know you can come from the place that i came from in my life 
right? And be in the same situation where you can have people respect you enough to want to come on your platform, right? And, and, and help clear up the madness, right? And give you the expert opinions. That's, that's, what, I, that's what I do. So if I was wrong five years about something, I just was wrong. And it's my job to say when I'm just wrong. But I'm never going to allow friendships that I have on YouTube to stop me from bringing experts. So no one should be mad at me. Y'all can be mad because I got these big boy shoulders and heavy is the head to wear the crown. I don't have a problem with that. I don't care if you mad. But be mad for another reason. Don't be mad because now we've brung a plethora of experts, right, that absolutely are confirming what we're talking about, the way we're talking about it. We have not brought one expert yet to say, no, that's not, you're way off base. That's not, no, they have tweaked it and have corrected things, right? But but our basic, our basic thing that we're talking about, right? This basic thing that everybody wants to run around the rosy with. One, what does the word Kemet mean? We have yet to bring an expert on that said Kemet meant anything else. We have yet to bring an expert on to say they have direct evidence, and they explain why. What in this particular in this particular interview, uh, uh, um, Dr. Maggie is going to explain what is meant by direct evidence, because we had people playing on the in between. We call it the God of the gaps, where just because you don't have that, you didn't infuse God in it. That they're, they're doing that now, just because we don't have direct evidence, they will infuse their own means to things in it. You can do that, but is it culturally right? So you can't be mad at me because I'm, I am at least bringing experts, right? That is, that is, you know, that is saying what I'm saying. You know why? Because I'm using the experts to say it. I'm not using myself. Now, on the other hand, the other side of the coin, right? They're using their work. That's okay. I don't have any work on the subject. Right. Let's get this real clear. They're using their work and their work like Asar. Asar has his own work. Smash uh, Scam Wellington has his own work. And, and they're saying that their work, right, should be the standard in Egyptology. That's fine. That's not an issue with me. But don't get mad at me because I'm not buying that box of rocks. You can't get mad at me for that because I'm sticking to the script. What's the script? If you have not went to school, if you have not earned those degrees, then you're not an expert. And in two proven otherwise, not what you're saying, not because you wrote something down, not because you got a YouTube channel, not because you got people to be with you. That's not the standard, ladies and gentlemen. The standard is, is to have a group of experts that, 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 that go over the material that you have, you have written, scrutinize it, put it through the strainer of academia and say, you know what? They got that one. And then I will cheer. That's what I'm talking about. Because you think it's right. Because the people that finally think it's right, that's not going over right here. That's not. We're not going to do that. And I've made mistakes in the past of big upping people too far. Maybe it's my fault. Maybe I gave people too much credit before they actually got there. Maybe we all got the big head, but guess what? I come in front of you and say, man, we could change that. It, none of us need to be having a big head. That there's a way, standard, established way of doing business, right? And into those standards have been shown to be faulty. We will continue along those paths. Simple as that. So don't get mad at me when I'm no longer dealing with individuals because they claim themselves to have the only, the, the, they have cracked it and they have it. Don't get mad at me for saying that's hogwash because it absolutely is. So this is a great interview right here. And I'm not going to be talking um, over her. I'm going to let the thing rock. And then I'll do an after show where y'all can come on. We can have fun with all that, right? But I never want to, I want to make sure that the interview is heard in this totality, in this fullness of it. So it can express, so, so that the expert can express what they're expressing without me diving in. They agree with us. They don't. We're not doing that like that, man. Go and play that full interview, man. Uh, we got a lot of people in there. And yeah, you're right, Sadiq. Yeah, he absolutely read that expertly. Right. Who's denying that? As a novice, you read that expertly. 
See? And that's cool. But shout out to everybody in the chat, man. Mac Rob, Shooter Kill Official, man. Appreciate you, bro. Um, RTG, right? Appreciate you, bro. Uh, Sadiq, you know I appreciate you, bro. Um, that good guy, almost appreciate you, bro. Almost, because you play around. You like you play. Uh, Descent, man, what's good? What it do? Uh <laughs> Cigar, what's up with you? <laughs> Lamar Pope, what's going on with you? Robert John, Quant, what's up with you? Fonte, what's up, man? Rock City, New York, what did you Zan, What's up with you? Mr. Metro, delusional. But what's up with you, though, bro? Adrian, what's going on with you, man? Got 28,000 people in the building, man. Let's get up to at least 30, man, to start this thing so we can rock this out, man. Right. Gary Hart, what's up, man? Make sure you hit that cash app early and often, man. We can keep bringing that fire material, man. So once again, we got another interview Monday. Um, let me see. I don't even know. Hold on, I'm not there going to phone that. Got one going down Monday. We got one in the middle of next month. This going to be fire, right? Um, so yeah, man, we got about. Yeah, about three, four, five more Egyptologists. And we're going to kind of um, uh, have some to have expertise in specific areas, man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Sadiq. Yeah, PK and the artists will be family one day, but not playing experts. We're not going to do that. We're going to be we're going to be men and women. And when we recognize we were wrong, we're going to say, well, we was absolutely wrong. You know what? They got that right. See, I can say that I don't lose nothing. See, I don't lose my audience when I say, you know what? I said that five years ago, but now I'm just wrong. See, I don't lose my audience for that. I've always been uh, honest and forthright, right? Like that's not, my thing is not built based off me being always right. My thing is based off of being, um, no, I ain't gonna name, <laughs> golfers, they don't name names. Nah, bro, we ain't name. <laughs> yeah, my, my thing, big up the golf field, man. Yeah, yo, he's been a loyal supporter of the community of skeptics and pseudo killers. You missed it earlier. I gave you a great shout out, bro. Great shout out. All right. Yeah, let them know, yo, this this, this your Rolodex right here. He's your Rolodex. Have you seen him interviews me on it? That's Garfield Rolodex. That's him. That's not going to tell you his connects, <laughs> but he got a strong one. He, he, he's strong. Man, I think he got luckiest. No, I'm playing. That's just hard work and being dedicated, man. And people hate on them, yo. But that's all right. All right. That's all right, bro. So we we want to keep things in proper order. We can give the proper credit when credit is due. Um, we want to thank uh Garfield, man, Garfield Podcast, man, for actually allowing us to be an extension of the work that he's doing, man. And we want to give him full credit for that. We absolutely want to give that. We don't want to take nobody's shine. We don't act like we did something we didn't do. We do not play these games. We do not play experts. We do not act like experts are perfect, yo. We simply understand the proper order of business. And the proper order of business is it is best, right? Because we're not in the 1800s, right? 1900s. It is best based off of the material that's around now for us to get, uh, degrees in said subjects before we call ourselves experts it is important for that simple there's a master there's associate degrees there's master's degrees and there's doctorate degrees doctorates it's important it's also important for us to look through our history through the lenses of anthropology absolutely important to have community that understands this and not allow individuals right to start making up anything See, this is where the rubber meets the road at. It is important for us to put our history due to strainer of experts. It is also important to motivate people to look like us to get in those fields of expertise, like John Jackson, expert. See? Leo Hansberry. See? Right, they used to they used to push them out of archaeological digs. I didn't know that, did y'all? Big up to the sisters, man. They run that um uh Deborah, Deborah Hurd, right? They run that Leo Hansberry Foundation. Big up to the sisters, right? 35,000 building with the 40 at. 
Man, y'all let everybody know we live. Maybe about to drop that, man. Yeah, I bet you do. We do love that Dr. Cooney interview. We love it too. Absolutely, we love that. We're definitely in direct uh, conversation with her. And she loved the interview too, right? She's in Egypt now. She'll be back. <laughs> she definitely will be back. Right. So, man, I appreciate everybody doing their thing. 38, man, we waiting for the 40 else so we can get the interview. crack a lack a lack -a It's a good one. Mm-hmm. Now, have her back on. Yeah, of course we're going to have her back on. She's dead. Yeah, absolutely we're going to have her back on. Absolutely. Man, we want to try to get a couple experts together. And this was Sosa's idea, right? Um, you know, parlay with Garfield. See if we can get a little, like a, a little thing. Pick a couple people, right? And call it Be Smarter Than the Expert. Or something. I don't know. Where, where we all can act. We can just... We can say, yo, what is this? We didn't did this now, right? We didn't actually did this, right? We didn't we didn't actually heard the experts say say something and then everybody and then one side disagree. Oh yeah, Doctor Stewart Tyson, uh, yeah, uh, Doctor Stewart Tyson. I, absolutely, I appreciate him. Now I might not agree with him when he when when he writing his own personal website and he say he say the black Egyptians, right? But then if you go into his details. When he's writing his papers, when he's speaking in front of his colleague, Joe, he never does that. There's a reason for that. So I absolutely agree with um, a Dr. Stewart. Absolutely. I like his work. I like his. I've, 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 I've read and watched his catalog. Appreciate him. Absolutely. I just don't agree with him actually making a website and, and faking y'all out using that, that terminology that would not have been used in ancient times. I just don't. That part I don't like. But when you get into his explanation of what he's talking about, I just said the devil's in the details, man. Okay, so we got enough people in here. We just about at the 50. What's up with you, Gary? How you doing, man? What it do? Appreciate you, bro. Tells. How you saying it? Tell, tells. What's up with you? What it do? Looking for a PhD, does that mean we can use Dr. Riketty Army? Absolutely. I appreciate Dr. Riketty Army. Hey, you know, I, you know, I know Dr. Riketty Army. Don't make me pull up on them old interviews on y'all. Oh, man. Beautiful sister, man. Beautiful sister, Riketty Army. Appreciate her all day, every day. The book of Al Jahiz, man. You know what, yo? Hey, bro, we got to support that podcast more, yo. You just sporadically, but I want to let you know I appreciate you, Gullah. Pseudo killer. Yeah, I'm saying he's been a part of everything I've ever did. Anything I ever did, yo, he's been on my side. Through the wars and ups and downs, yo, never traded sides. Never traded sides. Even in Gozi, whatever y'all know, he never traded sides. Appreciate them, brothers. Yo. They stay the course. They stay the course. DQ Hampton, what's going on, bro? Yeah, D D DQ. DQ, stand-up guy. Sometimes he be in very vicarious situations. He's a stand-up guy. Got to give it to him. So, you know what I mean? I appreciate all the comments, man. I appreciate all the support, man. We're going to keep bringing you the experts, man. So let's go ahead and get it in. Once again, I will not be talking through this interview. I'm going to let the thing rock, man. I want y'all to get out of it, what y'all supposed to get out of it, man. All right? This interview is here. It's also on uh brother garfield's channel man big up to the to the homie right there yo all right hold on let me get it all in queue here get over there and well, let's start playing it man make sure y'all put one in the chat man. make sure y'all can hear that man because i don't want to be halfway crooked with it all right great rocket Put a one in the chat. Put a one in the chat if y'all can hit the interview. Here go. Everybody, welcome to the Brother Garfield podcast. Today I have a special guest. She goes by the name of Dr. Maggie Bryce. And she's an Egyptologist, well qualified in her field. I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. Um, how are you doing today, Dr. Maggie Bryson? How are you doing today? I'm doing okay, Garfield. It's nice to talk to you. All right. So before we, we start the interview, can you give us an idea of your background as far as education and what you're currently working on? 
Sure, so I have a PhD in Egyptology from Johns Hopkins University. <clears throat> um, I specialized in the art um, of the New Kingdom period, so the, the time of Egypt's you know, great empire, the era of Tutankhamun, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. I also, you know, the program at Hopkins is interdisciplinary, so we do, um, we have a lot of crossover with our colleagues in Mesopotamia, um, the Levant, and so I was lucky enough to actually get a fair bit of exposure um, to those areas um, and also to have some training in Egyptian language, which I think is, is a really neat feature of the kind of education that, that my colleagues and I had on cutting up through Hopkins. So we, you know, got a pretty broad overview, you know, broad view of, of a lot of issues and topics in ancient Near Eastern culture. Um, and these days I... Um, I teach part time. I, um, I'm, you know, my research is still pretty much what it was. I'm really interested in, in the sort of stylistic analysis of Egyptian art, um, and I'm also interested in the historiography of ancient Egypt. So, how do we, how did we get the ideas about ancient Egypt that we have now? You know, what have scholars been writing about, talking about, thinking about um, in our sort of modern day and age writ large? So, since the scientific study of the ancient world started, um, you know, in the Enlightenment period. And I say scientific, I use the word scientific loosely, right? So the, the study of the ancient world as we think of it today, right? Sort of the application of the critical um, viewpoint, right? The, the, the critical techniques and, and thought processes that we use, right? So that sort of largely is born out of the Enlightenment milieu and the early modern. <laughs> world and so I'm, I'm really interested in how we get the ideas that we have today about ancient Egypt and how those ideas change and evolve on an ongoing basis. All righty let me add my co-host for the this this interview here this is our brother Unk how you doing brother Unk how you doing today? How you doing Bill Phil how you doing Dr. Maggie how you feeling? Nice to meet you how are you? Hey nice oh. to meet you. Um, This is um let me introduce y'all officially this is Dr. Maggie Bryson all right she's a uh, she, of course, she's a doctor. She's an Egyptologist. And um, she was just going into how her background and so forth. But Dr. Maggie, let me ask you this. Um, what made you want to get into Egyptology? Let's rewind 20, 30 years. I mean, <laughs> what made you want to get into this type of stuff? I think, you know, probably the same thing that, that pulls almost everybody to it. I think, you know, I remember being in a library when I was about about seven or eight years old, and I saw a book, and there were all these, you know, men in, in white tunics on the front moving giant stones, and I thought, that's amazing. I can't believe people could do that. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I opened the book, and, and, and there's something about the aesthetic, about, <clears throat> you know, the, the sort of imagery that just pulls you, and I'm not even sure why, um, but it just, it fascinated me. It always has. Oh, okay. All right, so moving on. What projects are you currently working on in the field of study that you're in? Are you are you teaching? Are you working on projects? Are you traveling abroad? What are you working on currently? Not much, to be honest. I teach, um, you know, just part time, and and you know, I've kind of moved away from the academic professional world. You know, I when I graduated, I spent some time on the job market and didn't find anything permanent, and and got pregnant with my son. <laughs> you know, figured, oh, I think I'm going to, I'm going to take a back seat for a while. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, I, I still have an interest obviously in the subject and I still read and try to stay current um, writing, you know, I'm writing an article now about a, um, a, a sort of Greco-Roman memory of one of the, of the King that I, I wrote my dissertation on. So, you know, just, just kind of things like that. Um, and I've actually been interested in, in, you know, this late, this Greco-Roman memory of ancient Egypt. So okay. kind of... All right. Um, so you you wrote about, uh, your dissertation was about a king. What's the name of the king that you um, wrote the dissertation about? Harmheb. Joseph Kepper said to Benray Harmheb. Okay. I was checking it out on academia.edu. You're pretty, you're a very, very nice writer, I should say. You're a very nice writer. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you got good, you got good skills. I was checking it out. All oh, right, I've seen you on a couple of couple of um YouTube videos, of course, with um Digital Hammurabi, and of course with my buddy Derek at Myth Vision. 
Um, do you teach? I saw a video where you said learn Middle Egyptian with Dr. Maggie Bryson. What was? Well, do you still do that, or what do you what do you, what do you do as far as YouTube is concerned? Honestly, I haven't done much. You know, I um, you know, I just it's something I, I usually come on YouTube when somebody I I like has a question for me, <laughs> you know, or somebody I respect, or you know, somebody a friend of mine. Like um, you mentioned, Digital Hammer Rabbi, you know, our our mutual friend, Dr. Josh, um, is the one who introduced me to you and. You know, if he thinks you're somebody that it's worth talking to, then, you know, I'm, so, so. I'm here to talk to you. If, any, if there's anything I can offer you in terms of my knowledge that'll help you in, in your community, then right, right, right. I'm here for it. So, Brother Onk, you got a question for Dr. Maggie Bryson? Uh, how you doing, Dr. Maggie? Uh, so uh, as far as the, the, the state formation, and I, I know early on the Egyptologists, uh, they kept it like in this Near Eastern context, and it was uh, afraid to put it in this African context. So uh, these days, where's the field uh, viewing uh, the Nile Valley cultures? I think these days, most people I know are tr try to look at it for itself. <clears throat> they try to recognize the cultures of the ancient Nile Valley as, you know, in, you know, cultures that formed in that region independently, but also in contact with that international media. So everything, right, they, you know, the, the moment at which we can start to see the culture of the Nile Valley, the moment at which we can, you know, the writing develops, the moment in which, you know, monumental architecture develops is a moment where there's already contact with the Levant and even further afield. So I think the effort is to understand the development of these Nile Valley cultures as sort of unique, um, situated in their geographic context, but also interacting with people from, you know, farther afield, interacting with ideas that were developing, you know, emerging, um, sort of in the Fertile Crescent, for example, um, because it's it's really hard to start teasing out all those strands and all you can do is kind of look at where what the evidence you have enables you to say does, does that help is that what you're looking for or? um well i, I know early on in, in early on in egypt colleges it was the focus was um uh, in the beginning there was a population that invaded into africa so uh, I know they've gotten away from that. They, they, yes, through that concept. So I was just wondering, like, and your understanding, how far has the field came from that perspective? It's come a long way, thank heaven. I think nineteenth um, century Egyptologists, the, the sort of nineteenth century world, right? And this is the famous sort of you know Flinders Petrie and his idea that there was some kind of pharaonic civilization that the continent of Africa could never have produced something as remarkable as ancient Egyptian civilization. So it must've been seeded from outside. And I think no one today would give any credence to that idea that, that the, that pharaonic civilization, right? The, the Egyptian world as we know it um, with its monumental architecture, with its language, written language, with its art, um, engineering, medicine, there was a complete unwillingness in the 19th century among a lot of people to imagine that the African continent could have produced that, much less that that civilization could then have been looked to as an example by the Greco-Roman civilization that they held to be their great sort of foundational civilization. And I don't think that anyone in the field of Egyptology now would say that, would, would sort of give it the time of day. I think a lot of Egyptologists are a little embarrassed in some ways to remember that, that that's where, you know, sort of the roots of our field lie. And it's true that the very earliest period in Egyptian history for which we have, you know, a lot of strong um, evidence, right? So in terms of like sort of the beginning of history, right? History is when you can start writing about it. History is when you have um, a written language. And so they, the, the written language of Egypt emerged in a period in which there's already a lot of contact between Egypt and the Levant more broadly, right? So we have, you know, imported goods from, you know, like lapis lazuli from Afghanistan even, right? So 
you know, people are traveling over great distances. And there are motifs that we see in Mesopotamian art in the period that start popping up in Egyptian art, right? So like the master of animals motif, this strong man holding the, the wild animals by the neck. And it's things like that that led Petrie to, to you know, and others sort of thinking in the, that along that line sort of go, oh, hey, great, they weren't actually African. <laughs> These were people like us, they belonged to us. They were, they were from, you know, Mesopotamia, from the Levant, from places where people are not as dark and, and so we can claim them, right? They, this, this culture, this civilization has to have been an import. And now I don't think anyone thinks that this idea that there was a wholesale import, that everything that is good and great and wonderful about Egypt came from someplace where people weren't dark. I think that idea is completely, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't think of anybody that would hold to it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Egypt, you know, just as you say, right, the Nile Valley is a place, I mean, ultimately, right, the Nile Valley is probably the earliest place that we find humans, right, anatomically modern humans right now, as, I, as far as I know, and again, I'm not an expert in human evolution, but right. I think our right. earliest anatomically modern humans come from the very southern end of this Nile Valley continuum, geographically speaking. You know, it's in Africa. It had plenty of time to develop indigenously. There's plenty of of human culture, civilization development in the prehistoric period in that region that takes place independently. And there's no reason why what we see with pharaonic civilization can't be the result of that civilization, just like any civilization, right, interacting with its neighbors as it develops indigenously. You know, I think the the you know, and again, I'm not like I said, my training, my research is all in a much later period in Egyptian history. I, I don't do prehistory and, and date formation as a specialty. But I, if I understand correctly, if I read correctly the current view, it is that that state formation process is complex, but it emerges from the interaction of people who are there with people traveling from to and from other places, just like any <laughs> civilization develops and builds, right? In a world where people are mobile. Yeah, it's good, kind of complicated. Three intersecting continents uh, with different populations confluence. So that, that can be very, very uh, murky. But I preach. Mm -hmm. uh, are you also familiar with maybe, well, you said your, your, your expertise is not on like, like the early, early formation. But have you heard of anything uh, dealing with the Green Sahara, that population that may have traveled to the Nile Valley based off of climatic weather changes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the idea is that, you know, in sort of late prehistory, right, the Holocene, the early Holocene, again, correct me if I've got my dates wrong here, okay. you know, because I know that, you know, I, I've listened to some of the interviews and, and some of the, the YouTube videos that Garfield has sent me the links to. And it seems like, you know, you're, you guys are, it seems like there's a sort of a tight knit and very well informed group of people who are having this conversation. So I know that you guys have done a lot of reading. Yes. And that you're familiar with a lot of this literature. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> but, you know, we're talking about a period, you know, in the, the tens to, you know, multiple tens of thousands of years ago when the northern part of Africa was not as dry as it is now prior to the formation of the Sahara Desert. And so correct. people would have been able to move around a lot more. You can't cross the desert easily. You have to have a lot of preparation there has to be and again people do right the, the Sahara Desert is not a complete barrier to the movement of people no desert is you know human populations have managed to to cross and even inhabit deserts you know using great ingenuity I think but at a time when northern Africa would have been a landscape of grassland with more available water people would have been a lot more mobile you know so people could have been going to and moving from the Nile Valley to other parts of Africa. Um, and so the idea, right, because if I understand correctly, what's at stake in the conversation is whether Egypt is fundamentally a civilization that has more links, more sort of connection, more belonging to sub-Saharan, sort of Southern and Western Africa, whether it is its own kind of unique thing in the Nile Valley where it's North and East Africa, or whether Egypt belongs with, right? If you had to play a game of sets, right? You're making sets, you would take Egypt and put it, stack it over in the Eurasian geographic 
milieu in terms of its human population. Is, am I right about that? I, I think for me, what, what I can say what was at stake is, is just understanding it in its proper context, regardless of what the results are. I practice scientific literacy and that's what we teach. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't matter. And then understanding the complete diversity of Africa and African populations. So what's at stake is, is having value and understanding what's really going on. Not how I feel about it, not how I really want it to be. So it's a Northeastern population uh, rooted in Africa, just for me, rooted in Africa. And like you said, early on, you had uh, other people coming back and forth and in, entering into the indigenous population. And for me, indigenous population does not mean some unmixed pure population. That's not real. I, I, I read the work like Charles Darwin, this book right here, The Beagle. So I've read this book. And so I understand the ideas, I understand the theories. So for me, what's at stake is just giving the people uh, reality and understanding anthropology, Egyptology, and how they see it using expertise. So that's what's at stake for me, expertise. I would, honestly, I would, I would think that talking to a population geneticist, you know, somebody who's up to date on, on really the most current thinking about what constitutes a population mm. and how early humans moved around the African continent is something that might be interesting for you guys because it's a really beautiful topic. Like it's really fascinating. If I understand correctly, right, the population genetics of the African continent today and in the distant past reflect a lot of diversity and a lot of movement. Absolutely. And I think it would be strange to me if the Nile Valley did not have movement to and movement from other parts of Africa, as well as Eurasia. I would be surprised if that were the case, but I'm not a population geneticist. So, you know, in, in the historical period, right? So after writing develops and the Egyptians start telling their own story in writing, in words, an image, right? The art, this representational art that in the Egyptian style, right? In the Egyptian idiom, you know, it seems like there's still a lot of diversity. It seems like there are a lot of different people from a lot of different places that get folded into the Egyptian population. Um, you know, and that's the case today. You know, there's movement of people. Like you've got people, you know, God bless them, right? With the, the horrible situation in Gaza, right? There are, you know, millions of people whose immediate ancestry in the last few hundred years is in Palestine, right? In the, you know, Israel-Palestine, in the, the coastal Levant. You have people who have come in from the Sudan, right? Sudan, the nation, or if you think about the region more broadly, right? So, you know, you have Europeans, there are Greek, there, there were you know, Greek enclaves in Northern Egypt, there were, you know, people who've come in from, from the West, from the deserts to the West of people who are, you know, what you might call Berber ancestry, people who are, you know, South Arabian ancestry, like there's a lot of movement of people. Always has been as far as we can see. Dr. Maggie, one second, for some reason, hold on one second, continue, go ahead. And it's really important to me that I don't, you know, talk out of class. Like I don't want to say things about population Absolutely. genetics Absolutely. that might mislead people because it's not my, my area of expertise. Yeah, I can tell you how I think of it, right? How I think of Egypt and its population, you know, and that is as, you know, largely its own thing, right? There have been people in the Nile Valley for a very long time. Yes, but a group, but that is an African population to begin with. Absolutely, you know, most people in in our concept, right? Like we we've got so much. I, I don't know. Like again, I'm obviously not the person to talk to about what it means <laughs> to be black. Right? Blackness is not. It, it is. Its own oh, man. Field, right? Like the study of of what it means to be black is its own thing because it is so complex and so rich, right? And so we've got so much baggage in terms of mm. our desire to think about humanity mm -hmm. as black and white, to have this binary, 
almost always to the disadvantage of people who fall into the category black. And I'm not sure, the ancient Egyptians in the New Kingdom period at least did think of the world, they did think of human, it seems like at least, that they thought of human populations as distinctive, you know, as being, you know, as, as a place has a people, right? And that you can tell where people are from by looking at them. Right, they seem to have associated geography with human phenotypes. But it's not necessarily the case, and this is, I'm speaking purely about the New Kingdom, right? And I'm thinking about, you know, the Amarna period, um, the hymns that, that talk about God creating, the God creating humanity with its distinctive types of people, right? The people with their distinctive types of appearance. And but I, I think those boundaries were probably a lot more porous than they became in the modern world and their definitions, right? They're sort of the way people might have been characterized and whether or not they could, could cross those boundaries and the values that we ascribe to boundaries, right? So there's always been, you know, in, in recent human memory, this sort of equation of black with less than, you know, sort of one of the great crimes of modern humanity is, you know, making that that compartment for humanity, making these two, like there's a line. And if you fall on the side of it that is black, then it's automatically less than. And this is how we've gotten a lot of really bad ideas about history, like the, the pharaonic race that Petrie imagined must have peopled ancient Egypt and created its civilization, right? This idea that there's a dividing line and everything that falls on the black side of it must be less than, and you have to come up with some explanation <laughs> If anybody from that side of the line does anything amazing, right? Good. You know, to me at least, from my from where I sit, that is baggage that it's really hard to shed. Because in the ancient world, right, it, it, that line isn't impermeable, at least as far as we can tell. Mm. And the values that we associate with it might not be the same that they do, right? The values that hopefully that we're shedding obviously, right? Like our aspiration as humanity is to get away from that kind of backwards thinking. Right. You know, and I don't think that there's a lot of evidence that in the ancient world, those categories were as absolute or those values were the same that, that we've ascribed to it. Mm -hmm. You know, the ancient Egyptians, and, and as you, you know, you and your, your colleagues have, you know, rightly observed, right? And, and noted the ancient Egyptians definitely recognized that they weren't identical physically they didn't they weren't like people from farther south and west in africa right they thought of themselves apparently they represented themselves in art as distinctive but whether or not that automatically meant that no one from those populations could come and live in egypt could adopt egyptian practices could marry an egyptian could become part of egyptian civilization you know a respectable part of egyptian society you know i think that's a whole other question Okay. Yes. Real quick, Garfield. That's interesting. I, I didn't even want to put you on that path to have to even put you in that situation. What I will tell you is our study group, the pseudo killers, we, we, we fight against pseudo scientific ideas. And so basically we recognize that race is a socially constructed, a social construct. And we recognize that, 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 that our values that we place on skin color was it the same values that the ancient world would have placed on skin color? That's just based off our limited research, our reading the experts, and so we understand that. So it's an anachronism to place our ideas and what happened through uh, enslavement to these period colonization to put that on an ancient race. We do not, we do not make those connections. I just wanted to let you know our feelings on that subject. Okay. Well, thank you for, for sharing that. And I appreciate it. Because I, again, I don't want to step over the line here. I don't want to come into a conversation that I don't belong in, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I know what yeah. it is. That's why you know, I, want, I want to make sure I'm being respectful of you all and absolutely. your. Absolutely. That's important. That, that's important for, for people, period, to respect each other's boundaries and comfort. You know, so if, I, if, I'm, if I'm going over the, any lines that you guys would prefer we not cross in this conversation, please, you know, tell me and step me back. I'm comfortable in my blackness. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. You know, you know but again, for, for me, somebody who looks like me to come in here and talk to, talk about what it means to be black, you know, I'm okay if you guys would prefer that me not even be part of that space because that's something that I, I got you. 
It's like you know what I mean? I want to be respectful of you all. Absolutely. You know what? Keep it scientific for me. That's respecting me. If you keep it Egyptology and what the field see and what the science is saying, mm -hmm. that's respecting the hard work I put in and trying to understand it. You know, science is a study of nature. And so, mm -hmm. so far, the best tools man have created, man and women have created, is science, which is the study of nature. So we're all in on that. And <laughs> and I'm and I'm black and I'm proud. Just uh, just for the record. <laughs> <laughs> we all are. Uh let me let me ask you this, um, Dr. Bryson. Do you um do you see Egyptians as a collective unit when they were being named as far as whenever they use the term Kemet? Do you see it as a collective name for the culture, meaning where the, the Desheret is and where Kemet is as far as the land space of Egypt? Do you see the equivalency of Kemet being the same as Egypt today as far as geography is concerned? More or less. So when the ancient Egyptians talked about Kemet, they were talking about the part of they were talking about the world that they lived in. They were talking about the land that they farmed, right? Because black land is the fertile black alluvial soil of the Nile. And it stretches from roughly, right? Again, very roughly the border between modern Egypt and Sudan. And that border is, it moves a lot mm -hmm. because it's a continuum. Right. right? Like Nasser right. didn't exist then, but we have the Nile cataracts that serve as kind of geographical boundary markers. You know, but people could cross them. And there was a lot of exchange over that line in various periods of Egyptian history. But yeah, so very roughly from the Mediterranean to the cataract region of the Nile and what is arable, what is farmable is the black land and what is not is desert, right? The red land, the desert. And so the desert on either side to the extent that the Egyptians traveled into it, right? They mined in the Eastern desert for gold. They, you know, Across the Western Desert to interact, where right? they had interactions across the Western Desert in the, the sort of ring of oases, right, that allowed them to trade and interact with people in, you know, Western North Africa um, and to travel farther south into the southern parts of Africa, as far south as they could permeate, right, to, to trade, right, to find things to, to get luxury goods like gold and ivory, um, you know, right, prisoners of war, right, people were, were forced to labor in, in trafficked in the ancient world the same way as they were not, again, I say the same way, mm -hmm. you know, human mm -hmm. trafficking is an, an eternal human problem, right, it's been going on through war and exchange for millennia, right, so there was trade, there was um, conflict, um, but basically, right, the Egyptians seem to have seen Kemet as what is now Egypt, you know, it's it's the same, roughly the same boundaries, the same borders, right? With the oases to the far west, the Red Sea on the east, the Mediterranean on the north, and the cataracts of the Nile on the south. All right. All right. Um, you have a question, Ankh? Uh, 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 back on the Kim. Uh, um, so, uh, for me, the Kim would help represent entire Egypt to its geographical region in Africa, the, the black soil and high, high, you know, high promoted uh, growth vegetation. So would it, could, could you also apply it? Have you heard it being applied to like, I've heard people say the black, black town, the black people of Kemet, all kinds of stuff. What, and, and your, and, and your reading of it and what your understanding, uh, what would you lead to more? Would it be, you know, dealing with the skin color or dealing with the soil? Which is more probable? Just curious. When the Egypt, if the Egyptians called themselves the people of Kemet, right? They would call them so literally, they wouldn't call themselves the Kems, right? <laughs> right? They would call themselves the people of Kemet. Okay. You know, Kemet is the place, the land with its dark color. Right? The word Kem is it means dark or black in color, right? So chem is also darkness. Um, you know, things can be described as chem, meaning black in color, right? A better translation of chemet is the black land, the the thing which is black, which is the land, right? It's a, a, okay. It has a T yeah. on the end, which makes it a, a you know, an, a noun, 
right? But it's it's basically meaning color. The color black is um, it's the black thing, the black land. And they also call Egypt Tom Mary, the, the beloved land. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, but they are the people of the black land when they spoke about themselves. Okay. All right. Let me let me let me do a follow up to that real carefully. So when they call themselves the beloved land, what time period, if you if you could remember, did they start using that term Tom Mary? I when don't I could not tell you when the term Tom Mary okay. comes into common use. Okay. I don't know off the top of my head. All right, no problem. So wait, wait, one more thing. So a lot of times us as novice are actually looking for direct evidence like a dictionary in ancient times that says this means the black land based off the soil. So how do Egyptologists come to associate the word Kemet with the black soil without direct evidence? How was that worked out? We have to use a combination of what we know about how the Egyptian language forms words with the context in which we see those words used. So in ancient Egypt, what we would call an adjective, right? Like a word that is used as a descriptor of something else. Um, right, the, the, so words in ancient Egypt, the ancient Egyptian language have roots and then they have endings that go on those roots to change the type of word that it is. It's kind of like how you add ing to a, a verb in English to make it describe that thing as a concept, right? So I run, right, but I, I'm into running, right? The ing goes on the end of the word run to make it the concept of running, among other things, right? Ings can do other things. And in ancient Egypt, the root for the concept of darkness, blackness as a color is chem, just the K and the M. And whatever vowels, uh, and again, because ancient Egyptians, ancient, the ancient Egyptian language doesn't write its vowels. We can't, without being very good linguists and doing a lot of careful reconstruction, and there are scholars who do that, I'm not one of them. We can't say exactly what the vowel morphology would have been like, but, but the K and the M are the basic root word, the idea. And then you have to think, you have to look at the how you're using it, right? So if you add an ancient Egyptian, if you take an adjective and you add a feminine ending, the duck T to it, you get a substantive. You get like um, a thing that has that quality, right? Or you get the quality itself, right? So like, um, you know, if you wanted to talk, if you wanted to say um, the darkness, you could say Kemet, right, with a T on the end. Depending, again, on how you're conceptualizing it, it becomes a thing, right? It's a feminine ending, right? So a dark anything is, is a substantive use of an adjective. So taking an adjective and using it as a noun to either be darkness or the dark thing. And, right, land is a thing. You know, you put in a country, right, you know, can be conceived of as a feminine thing, I suppose. And it happens in a lot of different languages, mm -hmm. right? You know, Mother Russia, I guess, is an analogy maybe, okay. right? So you add that T on the end and then use the word chem, chemet to describe, right? If you're, so like you'll hear the, you, the ancient Egyptians in a sentence talk about, right? I am from chemet, right? I am from this dark, is darkness this this thing that is dark and it is where i am from we look at that and go dark a place a thing that you can be from right a place a homeland right or i travel to kemet i travel to the dark feminine thing and the inference becomes that that is the name of the place and that it's somehow linked with darkness right and it's clear that the egyptians thought of right they they they, they saw with their eyes that black alluvial soil Right, and the same same holds for desher, right? The word desher means red, right? So you put the T on the end, you use it as a noun, the, the redness, the red thing, as and, and you hear it described as a place that people go to or go from, or that's next to, that lies next to the black, right? And so you build this concept of, okay, well, we have a red and a black, and then we use our eyes and see that, right, the desert is red. And the, I mean, you can literally, in Egypt today, you can stand with one foot, you know, ankle deep in black, farming soil and you know and the other foot in dusty red desert soil right oh, so that's why they say it's the soil 
not because the word is there, but using common sense based on the land and what it's what you're pointing directly to. And other, you know, sort of references in ancient Egypt, right, to, you know, darkness and black, right? So there's, you know, it's, you know, it's it's clear, right, that they're contrasting black and red. It's clear that they're talking about this in terms of place and, and the qualities of the soil, right? You know, and, and we can use our own sort of what we can see about the land and what we can reconstruct about, you know, it still looked roughly the same. Right. right. The Nile has stopped flooding. Right. Right. For what that's right. worth. Right. But, you know, there are still I, I met, I, uh, you know, someone that I, you know, was very fortunate to call a friend was a child when the Nile still flooded. And he told me right about going around and, you know, he took me around his village. Like that used to be under the water. That used to be not right. Like in, in you would have this dark mud when the floodwaters receded. Right. So when we use the term tenant, talking about the land. Is it, is it, would I be crazy to say, although Desheret is the red land, would they also call the red land Kemet? Or it doesn't, that doesn't, name is not used for, 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 because when we talk about Egypt today, it includes Desheret and it includes Kemet. So I'm trying right. to figure out, so Kemet would be that area where the Nile floods over and produce this kind of soil that they use for farming. And I think by extension, Right. So if by extension, by analogy, by stretching that concept, Kemet is the entirety of whatever territory the kings of Egypt controlled and whatever territory is inhabited by Egyptian people. Mm. Mm. I like right. That. I, like that. I like that. So I really appreciate that 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 that, that um, language or linguistic <laughs> lesson about <laughs> and again, this is my understanding, right? Like I I am I'm not a linguist, I'm I'm an art historian by training, but I was very lucky to have some very good education in the Egyptian language and in language in general. And that's my understanding. Um, so, um, you know, and I think probably it's, I hope it's one that would make sense to, to other Egyptologists. They would look at me and go, I think you've gotten rusty here. I think you're crazy or you missed something. I, I, I think that's one that would probably resonate with, with most Egyptologists. Did, um, as far as what you um, in your lifetime, reading the text and so forth, have you seen Kemet having other meanings? The word Kemet itself has it having other meanings in other cases? The word Kem, mm -hmm. or as an ad, like if you, if you were talking, if you were talking about something that is grammatically feminine mm -hmm. and you needed to call it, so like, because English doesn't have this, right? We don't have grammatical genders. Like, uh, like in, so in Arabic, right? A cup is kubeya, right? It's feminine. It has the, that A sound on the end of it. And so if you want to call it a blue cup, you'd have to call it blue with a feminine ending, you know? So if you, the word Kemet could mean a black female thing. And the word Kem could mean a black male thing, right? So if you wanted to say, I'm trying to think of a, a so like a house in ancient Egypt is grammatically masculine, it's a pair. And so like a pair of chem would be a black house. You could, you would use the word chem the same way we use the word black in English as an adjective to describe something that's dark in color. Okay. So uh, yeah, you did a great job of explaining uh, without like direct, because a lot of times uh, novice such as myself, we we're, we're looking for like a dictionary or something of that manner. And, you know, based off my study, I understand that, you could find a pinky bone of a hominid and reconstruct the whole body. And I just like the way you really explained it. That was very thorough, the way you explained how, without direct evidence, that you can come reach the conclusion that it makes more sense for it to be the black soil. There's a lot of evidence there for that. And so I really appreciate your answer and the way you constructed that. Very of course. And, and, and I would encourage you to always think and if you even if you even if we found an ancient Egyptian dictionary, because the ancient Egyptians did take an interest in their own language and they did study it and they did think about it. And if we ever found an ancient Egyptian dictionary that had the word Kemet in it and it's defined as Egypt, yeah. you still mm -hmm. have to think, how did we get that definition? It's like modern dictionaries of ancient Egyptian. Like if you take your your, you know. Egyptian vegetable, you know, the, the sort of classic dictionary of Egyptian language. And you look at it, 
and you think, how did we, how do we figure out this word goes with this def def definition in this dictionary? A lot of times you'd find stories like that. People have to do research. They have to think about how a word is used, what its root might be. They have to look at other languages that are related to Egyptian for analogies. Like how is that, you know, and like you're like Coptic, right? For instance, how does that word get transmitted into Coptic? How is the same phonetic root used in a period when we can be much more certain about how it was used because we have much more written language, we have translations, right? How do we, how do we get that definition? Right, dictionaries don't, dictionaries aren't handed down by God. They're created by people based on their understanding of their own language and, and their research into how those, these words came to be and how they came to be used, the way we use them at any given period. So even if you found an ancient Egyptian dictionary, much less you're looking at a modern Egyptian or Coptic dictionary. Interesting. You have to ask yourself, okay, well, how did we get there? You know, and I think it's very much, and I, I noticed, right, that you're, you're, some of your some of the the people that you were speaking with in an earlier interview actually had a crumbs coptic dictionary or um and i think that's awesome right that's amazing right like i think it's very important that i not underestimate the amount of research and the amount of effort that you all have put into this topic mm -hmm. you know it's very clear that you all are doing your homework that you know what the resources are but i would caution you and again i think this is something that even scholars, right, even people who are professional scholars, you know, we always have to constantly check ourselves and say, okay, this is what my authoritative source says. Well, why is that, why do I consider that source authoritative and what is the basis for what that source says? And then, am I interpreting it correctly? Am I understanding it right? All right. Right, so there are all these different layers that you have to think about whenever you approach something. And, and in the interest of time, we look something up in a dictionary and because we know that dictionary is a good dictionary, we know the scholars who compiled and edited it are good, we go with it. But there are times when it's it, even the most authoritative scholarly source, it's worth thinking about how they got there. Hmm. Because that can tell us how to use that information. It can help us think about how to use it and how to expand on it, how to go from there, if that makes sense. Okay. I got a um a question um regarding um modern day Egyptians. Would you consider the modern day Egyptians closely related to the ancient Egyptians as far as that is a real tricky one for me because there's okay. two different levels on which you have to answer that just as you guys just said about race, quote unquote, is a social construct. Mm -hmm. So there's population genetics, right? You have to ask yourself. What are what is the descent, right? The sort of physical genetic descent, and then you have to ask yourself, what does ancient Egypt mean to the modern people of Egypt? And I would suggest, sure. Do you guys have you guys ever spoken with an Egyptian Egyptologist? We need uh, one. No, we definitely that's in the works. That's definitely yeah, we need one. Do you have you got one? Got one for I, you? I will see. I can ask around and see if there's anybody that would be interested in talking with you guys about the real, like how modern Egyptians. And again, there's going to be a lot of diversity even there because Egypt Absolutely. is not monolithic, right? Absolutely. Even modern Egypt is very diverse. Mm -hmm. Like I speak a little bit of Arabic, but I can't understand somebody from Alexandria speaking Arabic. Okay. Right? Modern Egypt has the, the Arabic language has dialects. People's culture differs from region to region, even within modern Egypt, which you can, to be clear, right? You can fly from Cairo to Luxor in an hour, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of difference in people's experience and their, their values and their thoughts and, and, and how they live their lives. And so I would, I would love to have a whole separate conversation about that. You know, my, even the people I've talked to, some modern Egyptians are like ancient Egypt, huh? You know, just because it's not something they think about much. And some are like, yes, I'm very proud of my Egyptian ancestry. And I see myself as a direct descendant of the pharaonic Egyptians. And I think that that's an important part of my identity. So, like, you know, I wouldn't even hazard a statement there, except to say that genetically speaking, I don't think we have very good evidence at this point yet. No, 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 no consensus on, on the genetic evidence as right. That that's real. And matter of fact, I kind I read that. That statement right there in the book titled Ancient Egypt Society Challenging Assumptions, Exploring Approaches. And I read the chapter by Samaka uh, Kayeda. Man, she, 
Jeez, you're gonna mess me up if I mispronounce Samar that. Samar Kakita. Samar Kakita, mm -hmm. right? And, and he talks about that. So, um, just on my limited uh, um, understanding of populations and stuff, I do recognize that no population is frozen. So, so you would never expect the ancient Egyptians from 2500 BCE to be the exact same population in 2024. It just wouldn't make sense. Even in 30. BCE, you wouldn't expect it to be the same population. Would and you wouldn't, and to be clear, right, you wouldn't expect the Egyptian population of 2500 BCE and the Egyptian population of 1500 BCE to be the same either. There are right. moments right. in history when there are mass population movements. Absolutely. And there are sort of punctuation moments, right, when populations do experience abrupt genetic change or culture change or both. Relatively abrupt, right? You know, and like like when you think about ancient Egypt in you know the the Middle Bronze Age, right? There's a period when there is, you know, an influx of of people from the Levant, from modern day Israel Palestine, Syria Syria Israel Palestine coming into Egypt over time, right? And they do establish a relatively homogeneous community or communities in northern Egypt, right? These are the Hyksos, mm. right? So there's presumably genetic exchange, there's <laughs> cultural exchange, right? And a lot of it's one direction. It's coming from the Levant into Egypt and bringing in whatever the snapshot of the Levant at that moment genetically and culturally is and, and sort of gives it an infusion into Northern Egypt at least. And because Egypt there's is, you know, the boundaries are porous, there's gonna be some diffusion, you know, into other parts of Egypt. But there's those people are also taking bits of what it is to be Egyptian and moving back with it, right? There are Egyptians living in the Levant. No, right? So Right. And as to whether some of those Egyptians might not originally have been, you know, have ancestors in sub-Saharan, or maybe not sub-Saharan, right, but southern and western parts of Africa, certainly southern and eastern parts of Africa, right, the Horn of Africa or the deserts to the east and west. You know, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really hard to find the right evidence. Yeah, it's funny you brought up the hit post. I recently interviewed um, Dr. Manfred Bitak, right, and um, he deals with the whole avaris, the homogenous culture. He and is. Yeah. He, he is, is the study of, I mean, he is the person for you to talk to. I mean, that. Yeah, he's the guy. He went, he went real deep. Um, let me ask you this. Just to change topic, we're going to get back to, um, to the whole Kemet word and all that stuff. But when you look at something that we traditionally grew up in in a Judeo-Christian society about the exodus and the religious beliefs and all that stuff, how do you look at, at the, um, the exodus in the Bible? Do you look at it as, um, as an Egyptologist? Not as, as it, you know, I don't know what you believe or whatever. I don't know, you, know, know where you are in that space. But as an Egyptologist, how do you look at the actual exodus? I look at it as a myth that is that serves the function of explaining the importance of Egypt and its culture to a, a group of people who have their roots at any given period in modern day Israel, Palestine. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah. I, so wait. I mean, the way you explain that is going to fly over people's heads. I, I promise you, it's going to fly. I, I heard what you said. Can I explain what I thought I heard you say? Sure. What absolutely. I, what I thought you said was that Egypt was such an influence on the ancient world during these time periods that people, whether they've been there or not, would actually incorporate them into the myth to kind of give them some sway or give them some validity. Now, I just added that to that, but basically, I'm thinking that's what you said. I think that's a really, really good way of paraphrasing it. Mm -hmm. I think because, right, Egypt and the, the group of people, right, who from whose history, culture, religion, Judaism emerges, they're, they're so intimately connected for so long. Right. There's. And people can have very deep memories. Right. Groups of people can have like, you know, I mean, like just so like for me. Right. The Great Depression. I didn't live through it. My mother didn't live through it. But it's I I you can see how messy my house is. Right. Like I still blame the fact that I'm kind of a pack rat. <laughs> <laughs> my grandmother. Right. My grandparents grew up in the Great Depression. <laughs> Right. Lives very a very long time. People don't forget as fast as we think they do. Right? Traumas, you know, like my dad's a Vietnam veteran. 
you know, I feel like sometimes there are things about his past, his trauma that somehow get passed on to me, right? Or the Great Depression for my grandparents, right? Like the past, it even affects the way your genes express the experiences that your parents and grandparents had. Like the past doesn't die as fast as we think it does. So, you know, I don't want to say that the Exodus story does not preserve real historical memories and events. You know, and, and I'm talking here not about right actual efforts to preserve history, right? People writing things down or passing it down in an oral historical fashion that's intentional. Right. I don't think that just because, right, the accident supposedly happens in, you know, either 1450 or 1250 BCE. Right. And the people who are writing down the story of the Exodus are living a thousand years later or, you know, a few hundred years later. Depend and again, all of this depends on how you reconstruct these timelines. I don't think that means there's nothing there. Right. But. I think that there's more to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I think that the Exodus is a myth. Because there is no. To be very clear, there is no evidence for the exodus. As an Egyptologist, if somebody were to tell me that an exodus of over a million people from Egypt happened in either 1450 or 1250 BC, I would go, what? <laughs> or, or if someone were to say there was a population of monotheists, there was a single tribe that believed in a monotheistic Canaanite religion, right? living in Egypt with a very distinct identity, right? The thought, a group of people who thought of themselves as the sons of Israel. I would be very surprised. I don't think, like there's no evidence for any of that. But if you told me that a group of people who had longstanding cultural and historical ties to Egypt mm -hmm. were expressing that by telling this story, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It makes a lot of sense. Real, real quick, go for it. Real quick, real quick. So, like, African Americans come from Africa, but African Americans were not in Africa. But we have a genetic memory of our ancestors being there, being traumatized, enslaved, and brought to America. So, it could have been that the ancestors that were later on become Israelites or Hebrews, their ancestors, not as Hebrews, right? Not as Israelites, were actually in Egypt. A few of them. Mm -hmm. but, well, you, you, uh, Asiatic tribes will later on form different things. Africans will later on form African Americans based off certain, you know, experiences. All right, we right there at it, man. And the interview right there, man. Now we about to go ahead and slide over to the after show where we can actually get it in, man. Um, yeah, that was a great interview, man. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed her expertise. I enjoyed her clarity on it. Um, let's come on over to the after show, man, and we can muddy the waters and do what we want to do. But we'll definitely keep uh the expert. Uh, we'll make sure we keep that very respectful for her. She did not have to take the time out of her day, man, but she's developing a friendship uh, with Garfield and, and and with myself. And, you know, that connection that Garfield made um, is important for this community move, moving forward. Yo, we, it, it's unprecedented that we're starting to have the, the conversations and having the access to the experts. You know, if we can get the black community on board with this. Some of them have, have come on, right? But we can get the black community on board with this show. Now we're really doing something. The, like, we don't have to fight over this stuff like this, man. It's only a fight where one side actually think they're better than they are. That is when the fights actually start. When, when the other side tricks themselves. The question is, which side is actually tricking themselves? Let's get on over to the after show. Uh, me and Souls are jumping in. I want everybody hit the link. Uh, we're going to be respectful. Um, you know, you know, I'm always called smash scam. Well, smash scam. Well, into proven of the wise, but that's not in any disrespect. That's based off of the literature that we're all reading together. That's based off of what the experts are bringing. So with that, man, we're going to get out of here. I already got the other show set up. Man, make sure you hit that link. Let me see if I can get that link out there in the chat for y'all. Hold on. Let me hit that. One sec. I want to do this like this. All right. Let me get that link for y'all real quick.
Get the linky, linky, linky. All right, let me get the linky, linky. Okay, hold on. Let me get the linky, linky for y'all. I'm going to throw it in the chat, man. I'm expecting y'all to jump on. Y'all just have a very entertaining conversation. Uh, no cussing and fussing. We want to be able to hear each other out. Um, we don't want to do, we don't want to name call. We don't do, well, you just name call. No, I didn't. I said, smash scam wells. <laughs> He's scamming your intellectual real estate between your ears. They all do it when they say they agree with us. Anyway, appreciate you, Dr. Maggie, uh, for clearing up things. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, you can argue, chef. Yeah, we're gonna all go on the other show, though. We're not gonna. You don't cuss it up, though. You don't do that anyway. You don't cuss people anyway. You just get on people's nerves, Chef right now. Yeah, but you 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 are an acquired taste. It's something about us Baltimore guys end up being an acquired taste. Ah man. So yeah, with that, man, we're gonna get out of here. Uh, let hit, uh, here's the link. I got the link right here. That's the link, yo. Come on, man. Dive in. That's the link. Waiting on y'all. We're gonna start this thing, man. And with this man, um, Appreciate that, man. Appreciate you, Garfield. Man, hit that cash app coming in and coming out. Uh, we're going to end it right here. Let's get on over to the after show, man, and let's argue it out like we do. With that, man, Black African Power, man, pseudo killers on deck, man, community skeptics, man. Remember, never get smart enough to the point where you trick yourself. With that, man, we out.